Hello, I'm Rebecca Rose, President and Publisher of Breakwater Books, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to the digital launch of our Winter 2021 titles. But first, I would like to acknowledge the land on which we operate as the ancestral homelands of the Beothic and the island of Newfoundland as the ancestral homelands of the Mi'kmaq and Beothic. We would also like to recognize the Inuit of Nanatsiavut and Nanatikavut, and the Innu of Natasinan and their ancestors as the original people of Labrador. Our winter season runs from January to the end of April, and during that time we release six new books in six different genres. And despite the lingering impacts of COVID, they hit the ground running. Like all authors that have had their work published through COVID, these folks haven't had the chance to benefit from in-person launches, book signings, or readings. We look forward to creating those opportunities for our authors in the near future. But in the meantime, we hope you enjoy this compilation of video readings showcasing our authors and their new books. We've got nine authors representing six books included in this event, so let's get straight to the good stuff. Our first book is an anthology of creative fiction by 11 racialized Newfoundlanders, comprising a writing group known as the Quilted Collective. The book, titled Us Now, roves from Indonesia to the Middle East, Taiwan, Mexico, Jamaica, Barbados, India, Pakistan, and points in between, converging in Newfoundland. These stories are by turns joyous, tender, hilarious, and heart-wrenching. They confront racism and celebrate the act of enduring, what it means to belong. These are new writers and new visions of an in-the-present-moment Newfoundland, stories shaped by powerful voices, stories urgent, radical, and sparkling with beauty. We're delighted to feature readings from two contributors published in Us Now. First up is Prajwala Digzit, an Indian-Canadian engineer, journalist, playwright, author, and award-winning community catalyst. Then we'll hear from Navila Qureshi, who is an arts and humanities and social justice enthusiast. Us Now is her first publication in creative writing. Please welcome Prajwala and Navila. Ondu Nenevu. A dark shadow approached me. It towered in front of me. The brain is this hapless mess of electricity. Why it chooses to remember this memory and forgets the names of the uncle and auntie we were visiting in Tumkur escapes my understanding. You smiled, but as you turned, a dark shadow approached you. It towered in front of you. You knew this day would arrive, the day your paradise would be shredded into bits and your world tossed, much like lettuce in a Caesar salad. This new world of yours is much like a bolt of lightning, fleeting as a naughty wink, loud as the crashing waves, dangerous as the mind of Voldemort, yet peaceful as the calm before a roaring storm. I held her hands with a fierce tightness. They were rough, reflective of the life she had led. My tiny fingers playfully danced over her calloused ones. As the pallu of her Mysore silk sari fluttered over my face, a giant red bus careened in front of us, leaving a wake of dirt that entered the variety of crevices we possessed. Tiny speckles of dust clouded us, dancing to tantalizing tune of sunbeams playing hide and seek through the speeding clouds, some of which look like my favorite cartoons. Finally, the particles of earth slowly stopped stirring and swaying, giving way to a spectacular sight. You stood there, rooted and rotted by the mute stares of the throng that crowded the strip of sand washed incessantly by salty waters, its reluctance playfully wetting the hem of your orange sari. Only the wind spoke, howling at the audacity of the insensitivity you were subjected to. Only the sand stirred. You could see his stoic expression through the haziness of the burning pyre that divided you both. The mask was in place, and that is why your eyes travel to his thumbs. Ah, so he is nervous. They twiddled away, back and forth, creating tiny circles on his index finger. I tugged on her hand, making her stop midway as we rushed through the packed bus stand. Her eyes followed my gaze, spotting the newest attraction that had caught my fancy. A piece of cloth was attached to a tray that hung from his neck. Tired from the weight of the hundreds of tiny bottles arranged in a color-coordinated manner, 
he wearily blew at the end of the stick, producing a round, thin, transparent film of liquid with air, filled with air, thoroughly unenthused by this task. Upon occasion, he'd sputter, Bablu, Bablu, Hatrupai! I couldn't fathom his lackluster approach. I mean, they were bubbles, and he sold them. In my innocent eyes, there couldn't be a better job in the world. I looked up at her. She had the kindest smile on her face, and not because I was her grandchild, simply because that is how she was, and still is. After that momentary pause, we were back to walking. And this time, I guided her, my tiny feet jumping with every other step. Watching us speedily wend our way toward him, the bubble man upped his ante. Bablu, bablu, hatrupai! Now had a rhythmic beat and pep usually associated with fizzy drinks. He smiled at Aji, revealing three missing teeth along the way. Aji's soothing voice and his gruffy bark exchanged pleasantries, testing my patience. I yanked on Aji's blue silk, just to ensure that the important purpose of this visit wasn't forgotten. It was a kidnapping. For your safety, your protection. Yes, you are right. They'll remember me as a monster. Despotic and demonic, reeking of cruelty like phlegm spilling from pneumonic lungs. Yes, you are right. They will shake at the mere mention of my name, quivering like leaves blown around by a gusty gale. My memory will imprint itself in their consciousness like, a, like fossilized flora, only to be misinterpreted as the fangs of a sea monster. Like the stars in the sky that burn away to provide warmth, my sacrifice will protect you for time immemorial. It was a kidnapping. This is what you will say. Majestic is packed with vehicles of all shapes and sizes. They growl, spitting out black smoke with, this, with the despicability of an ugly monster threatening to chomp down anything that stands in its way. People and buses of a multitude of colors and a range of sizes enter and exit with the vigor of buzzing, bees buzzing at a hive. Today, Aji and I added to this cacophonous mix that severely lacked a breath of fresh air. We were heading to Tumkur to visit Aji's aunt's uncle, someone. I had no idea how they were even related to me. A dark shadow approached me. It towered in front of me. The brain is this hapless mess of electricity. Why it chooses to remember this memory and forgets the names of the uncle and auntie we were visiting in Tumkur escapes my understanding. Khadija, Jagar, midnight has come. As the world sleeps peacefully in its warm, cozy bed, you lie awake in anticipation of your monumental adventure tomorrow. Little do you know that the upcoming 365 days will metamorphosize you from a diffident, invisible young girl into a magnificent, boisterous woman with an endless melody echoing within the four chambers of your delicate, pulsating heart. You grew up in a fantasy land where the trees lay abundant with crisp apples, your ultimate comfort fruit, where the crashing of the waves left behind little souvenirs of millennia-old calcium moles that have seen every shade of our evolutionary planet, where the tender rays of a colossus sun baked your everlasting pursuit of enthralling escapades, where the shepherd led his flock to abundant valleys lush with foliage and feed, where the family ate its frugal meals on yard-long mats patched together with the discarded remnants of your siblings' outgrown clothes, where your formidable father mustered up a heavy sack of persistence and fear before heading out into the fields at the crack of every dawn, where your mother sneakily gave away her meager savings to the ice cream man who mysteriously gave you a pistachio popsicle during your school lunch breaks. Tomorrow, when you wipe your tears, remember to return to us so that you can relive your fantasy world, where the trees, the waves, the sun, the shepherd, the family, father and mother are standing by you, shoulder to shoulder, 
Come back to Kashmir, your valley. Your melody still reverberates in each mountain's hairline crack and each stream's strewn rocks. Midnight has come. Come, Khadija, my jigger, my love. Let's go. Our next book is the debut poetry collection, This Is How It Is, by Sharon King Campbell. Illuminating, poised, and wholly original, the poems range across the planet from New Zealand to Thailand to Newfoundland, gathering along the way voices both historical and mythological in a compelling display of dramatic empathy and poetic imagination. As reviewer Joan Sullivan said, this is a book about journey, touching on different kinds of travel across the globe, through perspective, and into the past. The words have traction, trekking in various realms, where King Campbell guides us through how it is. Sharon King Campbell is a freelance writer, theater artist, and storyteller. Her work has appeared in Riddle Fence and Word, and on stages across Newfoundland and Labrador. Please welcome Sharon King Campbell. Hi, my name is Sharon King Campbell. I'm here in my backyard in St. John's, Newfoundland. And um, I'm gonna be reading from uh, my book, This Is How It Is, which was published by Breakwater in March of 2021. Johannes Brahms once played a concert with a tie around his waist. I see it navy silk with red diagonals, a gift from mother, maybe, or someone else who gave gifts doubling as suggestions, a comb or lint brush, sewing kit. Before they were together, my mother sewed a button to my father's shirt. This was not a gift. But when he played, Brahms, not my father, silk pulling up against his belt loops, he became the favorite uncle, playmate with the best ideas, genius professor, invented all the best games on his keys. The city's built for summer. Only the trees, absent leaves and oranges, suggest this isn't Spain. Invited out to play by sunshine, we flood the harbor. Parks, decks out of use nine months a year. Breezes float to us with strains of classical guitar. Tulips spread their petals. Those daffodils not eaten by the squirrels reflect the sun. The color in the sky belongs in Turkey or Peru. No St. John's gray today. Was it ever? The errand runners linger. A slower pace, a spring in every step. This island time is whipping with the shoreline winds. The white feints of saints carved out of English limestone glare from their firmaments. Their colony is all made up of idolaters. They're worshiping the sun. Above, if you are patient, you'll see the buds expand and burst, their leafy hope sky-facing. Were I to sing, would the whales hear? No ocean, this prism of water, this geometry of waving blue. Crosses rise from its floor, a sterile calvary. I go in hard and pointed, push jagged toes into the center of the cross. X marks the spot. Potential turns kinetic. Below, the blur of lines deletes itself, each two-inch tile clear as northern sky in winter. My arms resist, at first, being made for land. But soon my gills push open, rhythm of each stroke and breath like rocking to sleep, rocking over a lover, gasps tingling in the core of my stretching abdomen. Plastic pushed into my eyes, leaves a ring around the brow and cheekbones, bruising. Forced seal against stinging water, against protective poison. The same stuff used to blind soldiers in the mud a century ago now wards off sickness. 
Now it's only nettles in my eyes. Prefer the silt of freshwater lakes in summer. The fish, slices of light, dart in and out of sunbeams, cloudy with the stirred-up bottom. I emerge from crystal chlorine water, soft though, stronger, converted as Barabbas. Whale call. Words tear apart in this wind. We practice reading lips. Here we are, on a three-quarter thrust of granite, grass carpeted. The ocean is our audience. We orate for the whales, not the ones we have seen breaching, who slap and wave for us, but their elders, calmly fishing well below, with just a blasted breath to signal to us on the surface. There was a mother whale who carried her dead calf halfway around the world, nosing him up and forward. Her grief was our admonishment. What have you done? At last she let his bloated body sink through their vast aquatic world. Out here on the surface of things, we pick late season blueberries, eyes to the sea, teeth stained purple with the decadence. Dorian. No storm touched down here, but the water tells us. A new green, peaking white, churned up from below. It says, this wave now splintering against the wharf was once 100 feet a biblical tower of force. The air knows, too. Pulls salt up from the shore to crust our windows. The wind says, see? I will be here long after all your homes have blown away. Thanks. How about an intermission of sorts? If you're craving a food break, we've got just the thing. Following the raving success and sales of their first book, East Coast Keto, we were pumped to release the second volume, East Coast Keto 2, by Bobby and Jeff Pike. Just when you thought it was impossible to find ketogenic meals that the whole family can enjoy, Bobby and Jeff return with another generous serving of low-carb keto dishes that will have even the most finicky eater in the family asking for seconds. Bobby Pike is the co-founder of East Coast Keto Online Community. She's also the owner and artist at Bobby Pike Art. She's the best-selling author of the adult coloring books, The Colors of Newfoundland and Labrador, and the shareable coloring book, Come Color With Me. Her husband, Jeff Pike, is co-owner and artist at Bobby Pike Art. He's also a senior database designer at Immersic Glober. Whizzing us through one of their favorite recipes from East Coast Keto 2, please welcome Bobby and Jeff Pike. Hello, welcome to the East Coast Keto Kitchen. I'm Bobby Pike. I'm Jeff Pike. And we are super excited to bring you East Coast Keto 2. Today we're going to be cooking for you the freaking deadly chocolate granola. We couldn't name it anything else because it is freaking deadly. Freaking deadly. <laughs> okay, so we're gonna start off with one cup of sliced let's, almonds. Let's get the oven going. Preheat your oven to 300 degrees. One cup of sliced almonds. One cup of pecan pieces. I've got those in all different sizes, small and large. We have one cup of unsweetened coconut. A half a cup of pumpkin seeds. Is it pumpkin or pumpkin? A half a cup of sunflower seeds. We have a half a cup of flax seed or flax meal. Today we're using flax meal. Just the flax. Just the flax. A half a cup of hemp seed. I'll do that for you. <laughs> Two teaspoons of either vanilla or maple. You could even put almond in there as yep. well. It'll put a nice taste on it. Half a cup of melted butter. You want to use your little scoop to get that out of there. A half a cup of powdered sweetener. Now, if you are not keto, you can just use your own powdered or confectioned uh, sweetener to taste, whether it's sugar or honey or whatever is your jam. There you go. And we also have one large egg whisked. Okay. A half a teaspoon of salt. 
And last but not least, one half a cup of Baker's chocolate. Now this is unsweetened because we are keto. You can use the milk, you can use the semi-sweet, whatever is your jam. Whatever you like. Whatever you like. So we're gonna mix that up together. We are gonna put it on a baking sheet. We're gonna put it in our 300 degree oven. Now, if you don't want chocolate granola, you can just take that chocolate out of there. You can put uh, peanut butter in there. You can put you can almond, chips almond butter in there. If you choose to use uh, chocolate chips, what I recommend for you to do is to mix them in on the very Good. end of the recipe instead of putting it in now because they will melt. Get this all gooey gooey. So we're gonna put that right onto a baking sheet. Let me grab that for you. We already have our baking sheet prepared with aluminum foil. And parchment. Yep. Good to go there now. How's that good? Is it good to go? Just about, I think. Mix it in and muck it in really good. There you go. That looks freaking deadly. That looks freaking deadly. So all that chocolate is just gonna melt right into that. We will spread that out and we will come back to you in 10 minutes after it's been 10 minutes and 10 minutes room. and we will show you what it looks like when it's done and we'll do a little taste test for you all right so we left it in the oven for 10 minutes we took it out we turned it and stirred it we put it back in for another 10 minutes if you want a nice soft granola if you want a more crunchy granola leave it in for 20 to 25 minutes now when you take it out it's going to be soft and it will crisp up more as it cools so don't leave it in there too long because it can burn now is your favorite time. Taste test. Taste test! Yay, my favorite part. All right, let's see. Crap, he's here. <laughs> that how, is, how is it? That is freaking amazing. <laughs> no, it's not freaking amazing. It's freaking deadly chocolate granola. And you can find it in East Coast Keto 2. Next, we feature the highly anticipated literary fiction Instructor by Beth Follett. In Instructor, Follett magnificently follows the natural tendencies of the human mind to dart and drift, to leap and eddy, creating an utterly compelling narrative at once patient and enthralling. Through grief, wonder, and introspection, Instructor captures the fluidity of the self, carrying readers away in the current of Follett's inescapable prose. Elizabeth Hay, author of His Whole Life, says Follett weaves a magic carpet out of many richly poetic threads. Reading Instructor, you'll skim above a troubled world and plunge deep into healing waters. Beth Follett is the founder and publisher of Peddler Press, a Canadian literary house. Her first novel, Tell It Slant, by Coach House Books, met with critical acclaim. Her poetry, prose, and nonfiction work have appeared in Brick, Best Canadian Poetry, and elsewhere. A friend and publishing mentor, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Beth Follett. Every woman needs the luxury to fail. Every woman at the threshold of a new experience in the world is given to paralysis. Yoga teaches us to breathe across the threshold. She was holding the posture known to practitioners as downward dog. Ato Mukha Swanasana, holding and yet not holding the position, a new and paradoxical concept that wanted thinking about. She tried to turn off her mind but didn't know how. The maneuver seemed impossibly difficult for a position that looked so graceful. Other postures had been introduced, cat tilt, eagle, crow and side crow, moon and half moon, until the studio became a forest of symbol and effort. Her heart pounded, her head hung upside down, blood thumped. In Atho Mukha Swanasana, bodies form more or less the arch of a children's game. London Bridge is falling down. She thought of that game its collapse and giggle as she struggled to hold the pose, uncertain, straining, trying to breathe, her heart so full that the sound of a raven's sudden deep cough 
overfilled it, and she began again to cry, tears pooling on the studio floor. Teresa observed the pool. Again, the call of the bird rocked the studio. In a posture called child's pose, she let out a single wild sob. If anyone had moved to touch her, she would have broken down completely. No one touched her. No one moved. The room was still. The yoga tradition makes the declaration, all is painful, all is transient. That we can feel grief and pain. That we can know more grief and pain is ahead of us. Our bodies are perishable. We will have to face death. Any meaning we have found in life will, at life's end, be forgotten. Birth and death alike create despair. We hate life because life ends. What is the point of such a pointless existence? This is the problem yoga addresses. A robin lands on the studio window. This problem captures, in essence, the spirit of our age. When was the last time you discussed this problem with a friend? Questions flow through her. She thinks of the cottage and its wide lake, of people she is meeting there, their strange, bright welcome, Barry's extreme kindness, more than four weeks have passed. She is starting to get involved in the things of this town, not smart. She has been able to put off her boss, but for how much longer? She meditates on the puzzle of grief. Why is she so passively allowing odd little Henry to accompany her here and there? The days accumulate without direction. Every morning, Barry takes Henry and Edessa out in the old mahogany boat. Some mornings, the mist on the lake is so thick they can't see the shoreline opposite. She drinks strong coffee from the thermos that Barry unfailingly supplies. While sipping black coffee, she notes small patterns, the rising sun paints on the water's ebb and flow and on the birch trees hugging the shore. Barry doesn't disturb her meditations. Tuned to some alternative frequency, Henry draws his strange equations. On Monday and Wednesday mornings, she takes yoga classes at Teresa's studio. On Sundays, she attends an evening practice. Between classes, she loiters, roams aimlessly through slack, restless hours, everything adrift. She thinks she might be dangerously depressed, knows she has become irresponsible. She has not asked Barry to look for the place where Roger's plane crashed, hasn't asked anyone why it crashed, whether the trouble was with the plane or perhaps as likely with the pilot. This torpor seems to illustrate what she has always been at base, a dreamer. She is losing momentum. Questions she's denied for years, secrets she has kept begin to rock her. She draws her mind back to her breath as Teresa instructs, the mind is a bucking bronco. Our next book represents the first in a new partnership that Breakwater has formed with Memorial University's Creative Writing Department. The Pratt Lectures were established in 1968 to commemorate the legacy of E.J. Pratt. Over the years, the series has hosted a litany of world-renowned authors and scholars, including Northrop Frye, Seamus Heaney, and Dionne Brand. 
Breakwater has partnered with the series as publisher and will release a new volume every March coinciding with the annual lecture. We were delighted to launch the series this year with renowned author and critic George Eliot Clark. In his Pratt lecture, The Quest for a National Nationalism, Clark investigates E.J. Pratt's poetic attempt to become the epic poet of Canada. And while Pratt's epic poems stand as lofty poetic achievements, the poet is never able to escape his own identity and speak convincingly on behalf of all Canadians. George Eliot Clark is a pioneering scholar of African Canadian literature. A professor of English at the University of Toronto, Clark has taught at Duke, McGill, UBC, and Harvard. His recognitions include the Pierre Elliott Trudeau Fellows Prize, the Governor General's Award for Poetry, and the Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Achievement Award. I'm honored to introduce George Elliott Clark. Hi everyone, my name is George Elliott Clark and it's my great pleasure to read a small portion from this brand new scholarly but interesting and exciting and exuberant publication dealing with uh, uh, Newfoundland-born poet E.J. Pratt and his attempts uh, to write a, a national epic poetry. Attempts that were very worthy but then also flawed mainly because of his inability to negotiate various concerns around race and language uh, and, and ethnicity. Uh, and so what are otherwise very fine poems are marred by his errors around trying to accommodate what we now call diversity. Uh, so I'm critical, but also very appreciative of Pratt. So here I go. I'm going to be reading a little bit of, of my uh, 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 critique of his uh, great epic poem from 1953, Towards the Last Spike, which deals with the creation of the national uh, railway system across the West, uh, essentially through the various mountain ranges between Alberta and uh, the BC Pacific Coast uh, uh, in the uh, 1880s. So here we go. Uh, Truly, Pratt seems uninterested in the vagaries of Chinese proletarians, save for the poem's mention of 200 Chinese tugging at shore ropes to assist a ship in fording a cataract, and soon this number is condensed into the racist epithet of the coolie. Uh, Pratt's Orientalism excretes, as it were, a discreet form of yellow peril. Pratt's remedy for this racial panic is to bleach Chinese from the poem just as they are airbrushed, so to speak, from the historic photo of the last spike being driven. Pratt declares towards a verse panorama of the struggle to build the first Canadian railway from the time of the proposed terms of union with British Columbia, 1870, to the hammering of the last spike in the Eagle Pass in 1885. But his heroes ain't laborers uh, anyway, but robber baron, capitalist bankers, Victorian imperialist politicians, and essentially white Anglo-Saxon Protestants with a bias in favor of the Scottish variety. If the English are disappeared from his earlier uh, attempt at epic, Braybuff and his brethren from 1940 as active competitors with the French, in colonizing the Americas and converting or killing uh, indigenous peoples, Pratt omits not only the Chinese but also French Canadians uh, from towards the last spike. Because this poem is meant to be a celebration of muscular Protestantism, tacit white British supremacy, and capitalist daring do with all the laurels granted Europeans and the chief heroism allotted Scots. Pratt himself comments that the poem begins to describe praiseworthy peoples and personalities by demonstrating the effect of oatmeal on the Scotch blood and spirit of enterprise. To accomplish this passage, Pratt reports that he consults Scotchmen themselves, physiologists and dietitians, um, and checks out the data supporting the idea that their greatness in helping to bring about the construction of the railway depended to a certain extent on their uh, 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 consumption of oatmeal. And that this had a very positive effect 
on the Scotch blood, brawn, and brain, says Pratt. But we can't leave out Scotch either. And so uh, Pratt also asked a number of, of Scotchmen about the effects of Scotch in producing uh, uh, the uh, Scottish uh, ability uh, to get the uh, 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 railway constructed. And he is, he is assured by various doctors and, and others that, yes, along with oatmeal, alcohol is extremely important. Scotch was very important. And so one might want to think that it might be necessary to get anything done it might be necessary to uh, have a cocktail of oatmeal and scotch uh, whiskey, of course. Um, so I'm going to end up here with uh, uh, another mention about uh, the disappearance of China and Chinese from the poem, uh, given the fact the Chinese constructed the railway for crying out loud. Uh, so Pratt's National Poem Project again falls victim to a racial blindness. It is fascinating that he publishes towards the last spike just as the People's Republic of China, founded in 1949, was commencing its drive toward awesome industrialization, a process that would accord the PRC, the world's largest economy, by the 2020s. Far from being forgettable laborers, as they are in Pratt's poem, the Chinese are already the world-class exemplars of Scottish virtues, of the spirit of enterprise, and being outstandingly economical. Apparently, Pratt lionized and demonized the wrong groups of players and actors in towards. And I will fin finish up by taking uh, 30 to 60 seconds to recite this small portion of poetry, just to demonstrate it's very good poetry, actually. It's a description of the Canadian shield uh, in Towards the Last Spike. Here it is. On the North Shore, a reptile lay asleep, a hybrid that the myths might have conceived, but not delivered, as progenitor of crawling, gliding things upon the earth. She lay snug in the folds of a huge boa whose tail had covered Labrador and swished Atlantic tides, whose body coiled itself around the Hudson Bay, then curled up north through Manitoba and Saskatchewan to Great Slave Lake. In continental reach, the Nick went past the Great Bear Lake until its head was hidden in the Arctic seas. Thank you so much for your interest uh, in Pratt and in this uh, scholarly uh, and respectful and exciting and colorful, pun intended, approach uh, to the great national poet and his national epics. Our final book is the compelling historical fiction, My Indian, by Chief Musel Joe and Sheila O'Neill. In 1822, William Epps Cormac sought the expertise of a guide who could lead him across Newfoundland in search of the last remaining Beothic camps on the island. In his journals, Cormac refers to his guide only as My Indian. Now, almost 200 years later, Misel Joe and Sheila O'Neill reclaim the story of Sylvester Joe, the Mi'kmaq guide engaged by Cormac. Reviewers are already claiming this book as an essential resource on Newfoundland and Labrador Indigenous history. We couldn't agree more. Sheila O'Neill is a member of the Halapu Mi'kmaq First Nation. As a founding member and past president of the Newfoundland Aboriginal Women's Network, she has been part of a grassroots movement of empowerment of Indigenous women within the island portion of Newfoundland and Labrador. Sakama Misel Joe is the author of Munji Becomes a Man, an Aboriginal Chief's Journey. He has been the District Traditional Chief of Miwipakek First Nation since 1983, appointed by the late Grand Chief Donald Marshall. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Sheila O'Neill and Sakama Misal Joe. So I'm going to read Chapter 17, Mi'kmaq Hospitality. Cormac was so delighted to see the wigwam and the fire that he reminded me of a small boy going on his first hunt. With the abundance of food and hospitality, I hoped Cormac would spend a few days here resting. It made my heart feel good and a little homesick for my own village in Miabakek. During the night, Cormac presented James John with an offering of tobacco and scolded me for failing to get a halibu. I wonder what he would do if he knew I had spent the night before with the family. Cormac tried to bring the conversation around to the Beothic people. However, we managed to distract him with Mi'kmaq songs and stories about my travels to St. John's to meet with the white man, who I called Al Glazio, much to the delight of my friends. 
When I asked why I called this man by such a, ma a name, I said, if I'm his Indian, then he must be my white man. At this they smiled and nodded in agreement, fully understanding that no person can own another person. It was almost done when we stopped talking and singing, our bellies full. The tired feeling of the last weeks was making Cormac ready for sleep. While Cormac slept in the wigwam, James, John, and I went to the lake shore. After lighting our pipes, we talked again for a long time about my journey across the island searching for our friends, the Beothic. I talked about my night walks to keep a lookout and to make sure the small band was not found by Cormac. I spoke again of my promise to our elders not to lead this man to the Beothic campsite. I wondered what would happen if we should stumble on a few wandering Beothic who might be out on the land hunting for winter's food. It was then that my friends said that the Beothic were only about eight or nine miles away, just a day's walk from here. However, this late in the year they might be further north, at their gathering place where they were hiding for the winter months. I thanked my friend for not speaking of any of this to Cormac. In my bundle I carried a beautiful knife. The knife had a handle carved from deer antler and had a beaded case made from deer hide. It was a precious gift given to me by the Grand Chief when I left Unamagi. However, I felt it was time to pass this gift on to my friend. My friend knew, as well as I, that gifts like the one I carried were never meant to be mine to keep. I was only to be the keeper and pass it on to honor a generous deed. James John had provided us with transportation, shelter, food, and information. More importantly, he would help me keep my promise to the elders. Well, uh, we're in the woods uh, talking about our latest uh, book, uh, and it's about uh, Sylvester Joe, who walked across Newfoundland in 1822 with a fellow by the name of William Cormack. And uh, this story came about because not enough was known about Sylvester and too much about Cormack. And when Cormack walked across the island, he, uh, he referred to uh, Sylvester as my Indian. And uh, I think in the book someplace along the way, we sort of says to Cor, he says to Cormac, uh, you know, you don't own people, you own dogs, you own horses, you own things, but you don't own me, you don't own people. So in retaliation against uh, Cormac in his own way, because you can keep in mind this is 200 years ago, and you wouldn't dare speak out too much against a non-Aboriginal person back then. So in his own language, in our modern language, he called him El Glazio, which means white man. So always in the book, he referred to him as my white man in Mi'kmaq. And never ever uh, translated what it means for Cormac. He did ask, and he just said, well, it means that you're my boss. In a way, he wasn't telling lies, but he wasn't telling the truth either. So that's, uh, so we try to, uh, I guess, the narrative uh, that was written 200 years ago by Cormac, we wanted to change that, and, but at the same time, uh, because he was going to school, we wanted to make sure that my Indian was not a, a even back then it wasn't acceptable, but at the same time it, it was forced to be acceptable because of colonization of our people. But uh, anyway, uh, Part of this book, I, I, I like the end of the journey, lots of parts of the book I like, but the end of the journey, when, uh, when, they, when they sat down and talked uh, at the end of the journey, after breaking into Chief's house to get some food, a long, long, dirty tree, they walked through some really rough country. Um, all through the book, there was a sort of animosity between Sylvester and Cormac. And at times it was bad, uh, but at times Cormac accused him of being a coward and at times, you know, once Sylvester left him not to get lost as Cormac claims, but to go and find uh, for sure who was camped out and make, making sure that there weren't beatic people. So he had to stay overnight for that. But the end of the book was, was after all that journey and all the things he had gone through, Sylvester uh, got to the point where you, you feel a little bit of sense of loss, that he was, uh, they were parting ways. Cormac was going to find a way back to the south coast and 
you had that back then, you had to find a schooner that was going down to the south coast or wherever you want to go. But Cormac didn't realize that what, what Sylvester offered him was much greater than that experience, was to travel with him down to uh, Bay of Spear from, from the west coast. It was no hard journey, provided he had good clothes and good snowshoes and, and a good guide like Sylvester was to look after him. But I believe from reading Cormac's journal that Cormac wasn't in good shape to do that at this stage, clothes-wise or otherwise. So he chose to take a, a route from, from Bay St. George to go along the south coast, walking in a lot of cases, getting rising boats, and finally making his way down the south coast. And in the book, we talked about a lot of things. A cradle board, for instance. Uh, Cormac's, Cormac's uh, I guess, vision of what a house would look like. And when you walk into a, a working wigwam, it smelled like the woods, it smelled like animals. And he commented on a cradle board and wondered why he would be stuck up against the side of a wigwam with nobody attending to him. And that today, when you have a baby, uh, everybody's attending to the child. Back then, once the baby was in the cradle board, it could, you could put it on the woman's back and she would go around with it and you could stick it up against the wall or a tree and it would be comfortable. And uh, so those are the kinds of things that we wanted to put in the book. And he also talked about going to visit Cormac's house because Cormac made reference to their house. And so Sylvester had to educate him in a way that, uh, well, if we went to your house, would we be accepted? Into your into your house the way uh, our people is accepting you into their house, even though it was a wigwam on the land, and it had a funny smell. But it was their home, and they they welcomed Sylvester uh, Cormac into their home, and fed him, and that's a part of a, a tradition of of Aboriginal people. When you invite someone into your home or in your community, you feed them, you look after them. So that's what they did with Sylvester and uh, with Cormac, particularly Cormac. Well, Sylvester knew the family and he knew what was going to take place. And part about that was Sylvester and, and the Gabriels con conversing in Mi'kmaq. Anything they, they didn't want to tell Cormac, they kept it to themselves and only translated to, to Cormac things that he wanted them to know or thought he should know. But at no time was he ever prepared to to tell uh, Cormac where the Bialik people might be, just sort of indication that he might be gone north. He did indicate that the Bialik people had a hiding place that nobody could find during the winter months. And uh, back 200 years ago, I would imagine that would have been fairly easy to do. Thanks again for joining our digital launch party. I'd like to take an opportunity to thank our funders, the Canada Council for the Arts, the Canada Book Fund through the Department of Canadian Heritage and the Government of Newfoundland and Labrador. I'd also like to thank my amazing staff and all the freelancers that we work with whose passion and commitment to books comes through in all of these publications. I hope you enjoyed what you saw today and that you'll seek your own copies from local booksellers. If not, and you're here in St. John's, you can find us at One Stamps Lane or anywhere at www.breakwaterbooks.com. Thank you.